another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is Life Planet Radio. Playing the radio, I'm Randy Moggins. It's July the 7th, 2015, in the middle of the summer of 2015. Um, that oddly enough has not been a long, hot summer. It's simply been a rainy summer, at least here on the east coast of the United States. How are you doing? Welcome. This is uh, old school. We're kicking it old time for this show um, to sit down and talk about some things that. Uh, well, they're at the core of what we do. And um, it's a big time. There's a lot of things going on. And uh, I'm not going to do a lot of an intro here tonight, but I, I want to just note a couple of things. First off, that um, we continue to produce new shows on our TV series, Off Planet TV, which is hosted by Conscious Consumer Network. You can catch that Wednesday nights, 8.30 p.m., USA East Coast time. Um, any questions you have about that, go to offplanetmedia.net where there's a live player and there's a time converter and you can figure out where you are, when you are, and how you are, and you can catch that. Uh, begun to post blog articles onto the offplanetradio.com website as well. That's kind of been a conspicuous absence for a couple of years now in terms of I've not really been blogging, but I'm starting to post some articles there. And um, a couple of these actually fit into what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, article by Robert Stanley on the Mab- Malibu Gravity Well and the UFO base out in uh, out in Malibu, California. Subject that's come up a number of times has to do with the Archons. It has to do <clears throat> with alien presence upon planet Earth. The um, the levels of dimensionality and portals, gateways, doors that are beginning to open. That subject kind of kind of brings us into our guest tonight. Um, we're going to talk about the demon UFO connection, and uh, also going to bring in some military intelligence information, black ops. My guest for this show tonight is a longtime researcher. He is a man who has had numerous experiences, spiritual experiences. He uh, He's grounded a lot by his own spirituality, by his love for this country, America, which is slipping right off of the rubber right now. And um, I get the sense that he um, continues to uphold that maybe we can pull this thing out of the scrap pile yet. But he is a regular contributor to UFO Digest, a researcher, and I think this is like his fourth appearance on this show. Well, well, let's just ask him. Let's ask Doc Vega. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Hey, Randy, how are you doing? I'm doing great, my friend. Good to have you back on. It's been too long. Good to be here. Uh, so, a little bit, first off, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is your fourth appearance on the show. Um, you got it. Okay, good. <laughs> you lose count, but somehow or another, another I knew that. And, you know, it's been probably 18 months or so since we last did anything. Some of that, my fault, too busy, and um, basically too much downtime on the old um, radio show. But, Doc... Um, there's a lot going on right now, and, and this article that you have posted over at UFODigest.com right now is, um, well, it's, it's, it's a pretty deep piece of research in terms of um, the subject of UFOlogy and alien presence and all of that. Uh, but I wanted to just note within this show tonight, maybe you can join me in this, Doc, um, we note the passing of uh, somebody that uh, I didn't know real well but had some correspondence with, and that is uh, Dirk Vanderplug, who founded UFODigest.com, the largest paranormal website on the Internet, by the way. Millions of, of views on that website. 
And um, <clears throat> there's an article on UFO Digest right now written by my um, oftentimes sidekick Chris Holly, noting the passing of Dirk. And uh, my words to that would basically be, well done, good soldier. You contributed immensely to a work that was neglected and relegated to the scrap heap of journalism for far too long. Doc, anything you want to care to share with me about... You've, you've been a presence on UFO Digest for a long time um, about Dirk. Right. I'm, man, I'm blown away. Uh, you know, all I can say about Dirk was he was a great guy. He gave me an opportunity, uh, you know, to, 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 to come to... UFO Digest, he marveled at all of my uh, paranormal uh, uh, articles about, uh, you know, the military and the kind of strange things that happen in the midst of battle. He said that he always loved those articles that I wrote. Uh, he gave me a lot of encouragement. Um, you know, I, I remember him writing about Machu Picchu and... Uh, when he went there and had a very uh, spiritual experience, and, and you know he received a lot of uh, peace, you know as as a result of of being there. Um, he was just a really he was a great guy, and he and I used to correspond back and forth. And at one point, he was going to fund uh, a uh, expedition I was going to undertake to uh, Dulce, New Mexico. And uh, for some reason or another, things got disrupted, and, and we didn't follow through. Uh, but he was behind me. You know, he wanted you know me to explore, uh, you know, the possibilities and what was going on there. But we, would, for some reason, you know, the, the the deal fell apart. But uh, I always had his his encouragement and his backup, and I appreciate that about who did that. He was a good guy. He was a good guy. And uh, again, you know, we just note the passing. Um, he may have exited a rather fortunate time, frankly. Um, uh, I you know he helped resurrect, uh, you know, UFO Dodgers. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, he he openly invited, uh, you know, people to, you know, contribute to new possibilities for the site. And I also know that, you know what, I, I believe that he was a devout Christian. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. because of, uh, some of the, some of the uh, articles during Easter that he supported, and, and uh, I did an article about Easter, um, you know, that he embraced and 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 he promoted uh, on the site. So, I mean, I really think Dirk was he was a great guy, and you know, this is this is a great loss to the community. He was just a, a super guy. Yeah, it is. And we just note that Robert Morningstar will be continuing the work over at UFO Digest, and for that work... I like Bob. He's a good guy. He and I have corresponded. He's a really good guy. So, um, let's talk about this article. And, um, you know, this is a controversial subject, and um, we're going to kind of slice it fine. The demon-UFO connection... Um, over the years, I've sort of contended for the idea that we have to be very careful about <clears throat> assigning, uh, you know, strictly malevolent intents to at least all of the entities that I think are out there. Um, and there are people on the f what I will call the fringe of Christianity that have gone too far. Um, there's a group that operates out of Roswell that has basically said that you can stop alien abduction with the name of Jesus. I disagreed with that when I interviewed Joe Jordan six years ago, and I still do. But that doesn't take away from the fact that I think there's something going on that ties into um, the demonic level. And that's what I would really like for you to speak to tonight. Okay. I have a lot of information on it. Okay, well, just begin with your basic premise of um, why you believe that there is a, a demonic component to the UFO connection, if you, if, you, if you can. Well, i got two stories for you. One, I took my son out to Roswell twice um, during the time he was going through his graduation from uh, Wiley High School in Texas. And uh, I attended a pastor, you know, who it was right outside of the UF, you know, the UFO museum in Roswell. Mm -hmm. And 
he had the gray alien icon with a, a strike through it, you know, that, you know, you've seen so many times, you know, through so many different icons. Oh, I even know who you're talking about right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, and I was going, what in the hell is this? You know, so I went in there and my son was going, ah, I'm not going to watch this. You know, I'm just going to sit out in the car. I said, fine, you do what you want to do. You know, I'm a typical teenager. <laughs> so I went in and I sat and I listened to a very tearful uh, testimony that this pastor gave, and he said that he was getting calls from all over the U.S. from teenagers and, and adults and elderly people saying that they were going through this abduction, uh, uh, you know, scenario, this experience, and that the only way that he was able to address and, and treat uh, with immediacy, the condition that they were suffering from was to literally go through a, um, um, how should I say it, um, you know, like the... Uh, you mean like a uh, deliverance type thing? Well, okay, like, in other words, you know how the Catholics do a... Exorcism. Exactly, you know, um, the, you know... In a sense, you know, he was actually removing the the, the dirty spirit, you know, the, the demonic spirit from the percipient, you know, from the person that was possessed. And this seemed to be the only way he was able to address, you know, and heal their problem. And he said that a lot of people were mistakenly um, attributing the uh, de- um abduction to demonic possession. Uh, it was going on with teenagers. Now, there, you know, there's been a real, over the years, there's been a, an obsession with, uh, you know, uh, Satanism, uh, with, you know, with people getting involved, you know, in these uh, satanic rituals and so forth. Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, and you can go back through history all the way to Aleister Crowley, who... Um, who wrote a number of very provocative fiction stories and introduced the Lamb, which was a fictional character that I think came out of a seance back at the turn of the century between 1901 and 1913. And the Lamb, as actually illustrated, looks just like a gray alien, but under the context of 1914. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it manifested itself as a result of a seance. Okay, so we have a negative spiritual entity that is traversing the dimension between our reality and their reality, and it looks just like a gray alien, you know. And, it, and it's hard to dismiss that as being a major influence or even an origination of what we're seeing now, and we are mistakenly attributing to being extraterrestrial. Now, even John A. Keel stated in books like Creatures from, you know, um, Time uh, and Space, uh, uh, Operation, uh, you know, uh, Trojan Horse, uh, The Eighth Tower, I mean, brilliant books that he read, and he was far ahead of anybody else. In, In terms of correlating paranormal um, ghosts, uh, you know, entities that we tend to associate beyond the grave as being no different than entities that we tend to interpret as coming from, um, you know, an extraterrestrial civilization. So, you know, there's this broken record in the sky that keeps deceiving us. Um, there is some kind of a force that, for a you know a typical intentional purpose, is trying to get us to correlate you know false expectations you know with you know the extraterrestrial uh, scenario uh, when it may very well be from a completely different source that we are unsuspecting of, and I'll give you an example. 
uh, take the Mothman prophecies, mm-hmm. and people, you know, looked at the Mothman prophecies and the collapse of that bridge, um, and they think, well, was this, you know, was this an extraterrestrial? No, I don't think that it was. I think it was an Earth-bound entity that may well have coexisted with us for a long time without us being able to perceive directly from where, you know, it, its manifestation comes from. Uh, and there was a good point made in that movie that Richard Gere starred in, along with uh, a number of other stars, where John Keel said, what if you have an entity that, due to a different vibrational level, a different dimensional form of existence that even though we may at times share the same awareness, they have the ability to stand on top of that hill just beyond where we are at and look further down the road and say, this is coming. You know, I see this as the future. There's a disaster just over the horizon, yet we can't see it. And you look at the Mothman, you know, you know, is so many like the elementals, you know, and, and you look into demonology. I mean, Christ even spoke to demons, you know, and had, I mean, very intimate conversations with them. And they, they equivocate, you know, they parallel the very damn things that, you know, that we hear these supposed extraterrestrials saying to abductees. And that's what's blowing my mind about all this. Well, you raise a very good point, Doc, and and quite honestly, I've always kept my mind open about what this was. I mean, on one level, and uh, I'm thinking back to the interviews that I did uh, with Nigel Kerner over in the UK back in 2009, 2010, and that was pretty much his hypothesis, too, on another level. Um, The book was called Grey Aliens and the Harvesting of Souls, and... You know, we're kind of in this paranormal rift now. We have been, you know, maybe a hundred years, but certainly for the last 60 years, it's certainly here in the United States since the whole thing busted wide open with Roswell. But, um, you know, you, you know, what, you know what, Randy, I think Roswell was just kind of like a reawakening of an existing manifestation, of, you know, that was already underway since the mid 1800s. Right, it just right. basically got reawakened, you know, in a different realm, okay, so to speak. So, I mean, you know, I've always been very careful about parsing this. So we don't have a lot of proof that these beings are um, extraterrestrial, other than they no, appear to display... Right. You're exactly right. Appear to display advanced technology, which in itself is, given what we know about the black government, is not all that fantastic anymore. But there's the other side of this, which goes into, and I don't know how familiar you are with the the Gnostic books, but I've done a considerable amount of research and done interviews, uh, notably with Robert Stanley, about the Archons. And I have become very convinced that the Archons are responsible in no small way for a lot of the phenomena that we're seeing. So, as you can tell, Doc, I'm, my mind is open to this whole thing. I've never con- concluded that what is being cited as extraterrestrials are, in fact, uh, beings from another planet. I've considered they could be from inside the planet or from another exactly. dimension. Coexisting with us, not, you know, unknowingly. Well, isn't that really the lure even of, like, the fae and the gnomes and gremlins and fairies and all of the small creatures that we've gotten down through lore? I mean, look, you and I both know, with any with any enduring mythology, there is a level of truth in those. They're telling us something. So, I mean, why not? What What is the trickster? What are these gnomes and other beings that seem to reside in, in dark places in in the earth itself? You know, Randy, if anything, our extraterrestrial hypothesis is probably more lacking than being able to look at these manifestations, these entities that you're talking about, as actually originating from planet Earth, you know, 
and and us basically coexisting with them and sometimes incorrectly attributing them as a extrasolar origin when actually they just exist here with us and there actually is very very limited evidence that they come from anywhere else but here and people like John Keel and Emanuel Swedenborg mm-hmm. and John in Forte, uh, you know, uh, in John Fort with his Fortean phenomena, basically document the fact that a lot of these manifestations and a lot of these um, incredible um, uh, incidents, you know, that that leave people spellbound and mystified originate from this plane that we're already on. Um, so it's it's almost like we don't even need, you know, the existence of another civilization, you know, from somewhere else in the universe. You know, it's already populated, you know, pretty well here already, you know, if you get my drift. Well, you know, and I've been leaking for a long time now and certainly a lot lately about, you know, my experiences. And I have to tell you something that my my own incidents, um, missing time and strange circumstances and things that went on around me have left me wondering as well what it was. Because there seems to be... Uh, this isn't just phenomenological, as I, as I know you realize. This is spiritual, too. There are things that go on with abductions. And, I mean, I, I've interviewed lots of abductees, um, done tons of research into this and I can tell you from all of that plus my own experiences that there is a spiritual component to this and it feels to me a lot of times Doc like there's a deception within all of this it's why I I, I think abductees slash contactees experiencers always seem to have a question mark even behind the things that they, they, they put out as fact no doubt about it no doubt about it um, the question that sticks out in my mind, you know, when I when you know I've, I've read the works of John Keel, uh, and you know, and witnessed this particular pastor's observations in uh, Roswell, New Mexico, that uh, there seems to be an intentional deception, you know, under the surface. Um, it's subliminal, but it's insidious. And it's it's like a misdirection, you know, that, that is actually being conducted by whatever you want to attribute to. You might say Lucifer, you know, you might say, you know, uh, 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 an extraterrestrial entity that is subliminally controlling Earth. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it, it has a spiritual origin. And I'm going to give you a, a, a very interesting story. Uh, you do remember Carla Turner, right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, you know, I was in a UFO encounter group in Plano, Texas, that had intimate connections with Carla Turner, and she was a very beloved researcher, uh, very well respected by all of us. We all loved her, and she she just absolutely gave her heart and her soul to people that had been abducted, you know, trying to find out, um, you know, number one, what was behind the phenomenon, number two, how to treat these people because they were being rejected by the psychological community, they were being rejected by the medical community, by all conventional means that they were simply being uh, shrugged off as though they're... um, the malady they were suffering from was basically inconsequential. Well, they basically were treated as being mentally ill, delusional, schizophrenic, psychotic. Even worse than that, that, like they were hallucinatory idiots, okay? Mm -hmm. And Carla was going out of her way to deal with these people, to to interview them, much like Bud Hopkins, um, you know, to do regressional therapy, uh, to give validity you know, to healing and treatment for these people. Uh, She was doing an amazing job, and I didn't meet her personally, but I knew much about her from the people that loved her and dealt with her. So basically, um, 
I was suggesting, you know, she was suffering from cancer and it was terminal. And I was trying to make some, you know, alternative, uh, you know, health uh, uh, treatments available, you know, to her through the, you know, uh, UFO abductee group, you know, so they could convey this to her. Unfortunately, you know, she died not, you know, too long afterwards. But I will tell you that this goes all the way back to Rendlesham Forest and the 1980s sighting that was done at the Strategic Air Command Base with a number of different security officers and as well um, uh, Commander Halt. And all of their observations, all their witness testimony, and one of them came to Carla and they said, man, I mean, I am just, I'm, I'm suffering, I can't sleep, I'm having visions, I'm having disturbing nightmares, I, I can't live my life, um, I'm having, you know, extreme problems. And Carla chose to try to treat this individual. Now, you've got to look at this as being demonological. I tried to look at it as being extraterrestrial, but I, I can't do it in view of, of the witness testimony here. But... They they put this security officer, he was a very tormented individual, under regressive therapy. And in the midst of the, in, you know, the, the subtle inqu inquiry, uh, you know, asking somebody to re-experience, you know, past, uh, um, how should I say it, the, the memories of their past experiences. Suppressed memories. And he began to physically transform into an entity. His skin, um, his face, his features, completely physically, he began to transform. And Carla and the man that was assisting her, and he was also a military intelligence officer. I, I can't think of his name right now. And he went through a divorce as a result of the stress of, you know, of what, you know, he was going through. Um, and they had to regress this. They had to wake this guy up. They had to bring him out of it because he was going to completely transform into another being. And they did not want to, you know, deal with that. They didn't want to have to. Well, they didn't know how. Uh, so they were, luckily, they, they were successful in being able to bring him back and to stop the uh, physical transformation that was going on. And when news came of that to the, you know, the group, you know, and, and I was interviewing them and I was going to, you know, there's going to be inclusion into a, um, a documentary project that we were working on for Pino Telecable. And so this was, you know, uh, this was a seminal footage and content that we needed at the core of the film and this is very important. And uh, when this happened, I mean, we were all scratching our heads trying to figure out where in the hell is this coming from? I mean, what is manifesting this? And I really, to this day, I have to, I have to point, I have to go to demonological. I, I, I can't go to extraterrestrial, you know, uh, as this, the source of this transformation. It's just, it's too weird. I was just um, I was just looking at um, Dr. Carla Turner's material, the Mas Masquerade of Angels. Her uh, her book that she wrote with Ted Rice uh, kind of goes in into you know the whole uh, I guess theological side of this. Right, and right. She was a very spiritual person. You know, it, it it really is you know frightening when you think of the number of people. And, you know, I've, Doc, I don't know how much you've followed what I've done over the years. I walk a pretty thin line in terms of, you know, not judging, but at the same time being discerning about what people, you know, attest to. Hey, you. Boy, I'm the same way. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm right there with you. I'm the same way. But I've also expressed my concerns about the fact that too many people seem to find... Um, Kind of an elation and enlightenment, an almost godlike um, reverence for these ETs, and even people that have had horrendous, scary experiences. Um, and there's a number of books out there. I, I'm not going to mention them right now, but there's one particular one that I'm thinking of. 
turns around and basically begins to communicate um, basically a new age and time scenario that sounds, you know, seductive and yet at the same time frightening from the standpoint that it looks like people are giving their power up to something other than themselves or their creator. Yeah, and very possibly to a deceptive, evil source. And it does feel like, you know, kind of an end of times. I mean, look, you know, I backed away from this for years, Doc, but I really came to the conclusion that, holy crap, we really are in the midst of it right now, if you just look at the events around us. Well, then you add to that the pronouncements that have been made. Go ahead. Randy, I agree with you. I believe that we are approaching the end times. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are going to reject the biblical, you know, scenario. To oh, yeah. It. yeah. But, you know, if you take a look at, at what, okay, if, if you look at everything from a secular standpoint, then you are actually allowing yourself to totally disacknowledge the spiritual side of what's going on on this planet. When you are only trying to look at a cause and effect physical relationship between, you know, whatever it is. I mean, you know, in other words, like, you know, you figure like when a, a mass shooter goes out and, and, and executes people, well, I mean, you know, there's got to be some psychological or, you know, or, or intellectual, you know, like um, explanation. And I, I really think it goes a lot deeper than that. And I think that. You know, we're approaching, uh, you know, like a critical mass. Oh, yeah. Where, yeah. Um, you know, we're, we can't back off anymore. I mean, it, it's not a matter of resources on the planet or climate change. That has nothing to do with it because we could perpetuate our physical existence on this globe indefinitely, you know, with scientific improvements and conservation and whatever. And we don't have to... Um, hold people hostage and restrict their rights to do so if governments will get away from collectivism and statism. It can be done in a very, very, uh, you know, um, how should I say it? Um, it would be done the way we used to do it. It would be, be done right. through cooperation, <laughs> goodwill, hard work, yeah. and spiritual values. Exactly. Um but there's something else going on. I mean, we're we're headed towards, you know, I, I hate to say Armageddon, but if you look at, at the Obama administration right now, the way they're negotiating with the Iranian government, you know, where the parliament is chanting death to America, and they're giving all of these incentives and all of these compromises, you know, for nuclear development and missile delivery development to Iran, and our president just continues to, you know, to placate, you know, the, the radical Muslim cause. And he can get all upset about the Confederate flag, but when Christians are being slaughtered and their heads are being cut off, you'll never hear one word, you know, uh, from him uh, about outrage or, you know, how inhuman this is or how much against God's plan all of this is. So... You know, I believe that there, you know, that the powers that be, Russia and China and the Middle East and the U.S., we are all at this time, we are converging. Uh, and there is, as Robert Oppenheimer said about nuclear power, he said, we're all, you know, we're, we're cooking this soup, you know, which was the Cold War, you know, and... There is going, it's going to come to a head. You know, we're going to get to a point where, you know, you can't walk away from it anymore. It will, um, it will come to a point where, you know, it, it's critical mass and there's going to be a war and, it's, and we're going to annihilate millions and millions and millions of people. Well, just look, look at this absurdity right now. I mean, even just to trot out the idea, much less the implementation of putting our own troops in country, situation, 
in the United, territorial United States and calling it an exercise. Well, if it's an exercise, what is an exercise in? What are you training for? And then to find you're, out you're that... You're talking about Jade Helm, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I'm talking about Jade Helm. Yeah, and, and that has me extremely concerned. Extremely. You know, and I remember McDill Air Base in Florida making this dismissive statement. Oh, it's nothing more than a joint training exercise. Well, you know what? That joint training exercise has been going on up in Dakota, in Montana, and a number of small towns since 2009. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a... House to house, you know, uh, assaults and searches and confiscations and arrests and detainments. You know, and Randy, also remember this. We have anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 foreign troops on our soil. I was just going to bring that up. NATO troops. And these people do not give a damn about the U.S. Constitution or freedom of religion or the kind of rights that you and I enjoy that our forefathers died so that you and I could appreciate them and live in the warmth and the enlightenment of such an existence. Yeah. Well, you know, from my my standpoint right now, Jade Helm represents something, I think, even a little bit darker. There's a lot of information that's being leaked on the Internet right now about the fact that... Martial law, right? Well, not just martial law. It's something called... Um, Mm, let me pull this up here. Um, mastering the human domain. Uh, does that sound creepy enough for you? The human. What the hell is the human domain? Well, it's human consciousness. It is basically uh, an artificial yeah. intelligence computer system that's designed to command and control people, resources, land. And events operating in same thing as Agenda Twenty One. Same thing as Agenda oh, it is, 21. it is, it is. It's yeah on steroids. Well, they change it though, but they change the the terminology to sustainable, you know, to sustainable growth, sustainability, and so you have a lot of you know, like you have more than nine hundred cities in the United States now that their mayor mayoral. Um, organizations have chosen without the consent of the people to go ahead and include their cities under the aegis of sustainability, which is Agenda 21, and, and the same thing you're talking about, where there's a collective um, international control of consciousness and resources mm-hmm. and people's free. Here's the point that I want to make, Doc. I don't care who they got permission from. I don't care if they went to the county, the local municipalities, deputy dog, whatever. They don't have even the authority to ask to do these exercises. None. Um, No, they don't. I understand that Mr. Obama thinks that he put Posse Comitatus to sleep back on New Year's Eve 2011 when he signed the NDAA. The A law is right. However, the last time I looked, nobody has voided out the constitutional protections that we have and the establishment of even uh, the, the constitutional is very clear even about housing troops and what what uh, constituted legal forts and places where the military was supposed to operate. We're so far down the road now that people don't even know what questions to ask. And, you know, I know you're a constitutional guy. So am I. And, uh, you know, we've got to start asking the right questions, and we've got to start demanding from our leaders that they stand by the foundational laws of this country, which are encoded in the Constitution, and not the statutes of these corporations, governments, lapdogs, Military General Pentagon on steroids, Jesus Christ Almighty, these people are quite frankly insane. They're just, they're, they're gunning to take down. They're megalomaniacs, man. They're, they are megalomaniacs. You know, yeah. they, they want control at all costs, and, and people's lives are expendable. We're like livestock to them. Exactly. No, I, I'm. Uh, you know, kind of like Santa Ana said, you know, when he took the Alamo. 
And, you know, his officer said, you know, we lost 1,600 men just so that we could take a fort that had, you know, little more than 200 Texans and, and whoever. And he said, you know what? He says, my soldiers are like chickens, like the lives of chickens. And this is, you know, what these elitist, you know, people on the upper echelons, you know, of, of you know, world control today in the U.N. and the CFR and the Trilateral Commission, um, you know, these people that feel like all they have to do basically is vet and qualify people to join their organization, you know, so that basically they can spread their control over the masses. Begins to sound like the Book of Revelation, doesn't it? Well, some things start, start to become inescapable. The realizations just become too much to, to escape. Let me ask you this. Do you think that we still have a potential scenario for them, they, whoever they are, the cabal, whatever, to hook up some Operation Blue Beam type thing on us? Uh, Adrian Sabuji of Argentina. Uh, Argentina is one of two countries, Argentina and Iceland, who have rebelled against their central banking system and against the government, that the central government that was controlling it and, and, and in cahoots with it. They rebelled and they took control of their currency, unlike, you know, Americans who are much too comfortable and much too self-involved, you know, to worry about, you know, actually standing up to the powers that be like we should be doing, yeah. okay? Yeah. And what they did was they rebelled, they broke the system, and they said, we are going to take care of our, you know, monetary system. We will, you know, establish, we will control it. And you can go to Iceland and actually get a much better deal on a CD on on the return of the interest on your investment, then you can you get zero percent or barely above the Federal Reserve in the United States. But Iceland will give you five to five to six percent. And Adrian Salbucci, uh, you know, speaks of his own culture in Argentina. He said, "Beware." He said they have the technological capability of being able to actually create a extraterrestrial invasion scenario, mm -hmm. a false flag operation on a global scale to where they can convince you that um, we need all of this control because there is an insidious aggressor out there who comes from another, another civilization and he's going to take away everything you have. So you better give, our, give your freedom to us and we'll control it for you and we We'll protect it for you. So trust us, and we'll defeat, you know, these horrid aggressors. You know, and Tom Jefferson and James Madison and Ben Franklin and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, they all warned us about this shit 300 years ago, That's right. man. That's right. Yeah. They were just incredible people. Uh, you know, and it's, I hate to say it because in a lot of ways I love the guy, but Ronald Reagan invoked that we'd all get together a whole lot better if the, we were under threat of an attack from an alien race. And I'm, you know, hey. Uh, yeah, you know what? I totally agree with Ronald Reagan. And, and, and go back to a little bit further than that, Randy. Go back to um, MacArthur. Yeah. MacArthur, after the, uh, let's get into military intelligence. Let's now, go there. Okay? 1944, Foo Fighters, okay, all kinds of, you know, unidentified objects being seen in the midst of horrid skirmishes going on between the Germans and the Axis forces in, in, in American, you know, 8th, uh, 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 the, um, the Air Force 8th Bomber Group uh, over uh, Europe and go to, uh, you know, um, the uh, the Pacific Fleet um, in the in the Pacific Ocean island hopping, you know, and retaking all the islands that we lost. Time and time again, there were unidentified luminous objects, you know, that that either were capable 
of flying above and beyond with serenity over horrid battles where uh, kamikazes were smashing into into our uh, our ships, where you know uh, you know Japanese zeros and, and United States uh, you know uh, fighter aircraft collided in the skies, uh, and yet there were these luminous objects that were unexplainable flying in the midst of battle that were totally unharried. Um, and unscathed by these vicious battles of air, any aircraft artillery, uh, strafing, um, you know, five inch guns, 12 inch guns being fired in, you know, in the, into the uh, atmosphere to try to bring down bombers and, and fighter aircraft. And yet here you have these unidentified objects that are flying in the midst of these battles and these pilots are going, who in the hell is this? You know, is this a manifestation of the enemy? Is this a secret project? And the Germans were very worried about it. The Allies were very worried about it. We had bomber crews that were in hysterics as they withdrew to their air bases uh, in England after dropping bombs over Germany because a Foo Fighter had paced their B-17 all the way back to, uh, you know, Great Britain. And they were thinking, well, it's got to be the Germans, man. They're going to shoot us down. But it wasn't. And in, in over the Pacific, uh, you know, you had the, you know, these carrier groups duking it out with each other, you know, launching, you know, uh, assault, you know, uh, squadrons and, and dropping bombs on each other. And here are airborne, airborne flotillas of unidentif unidentified aircraft, and they can't establish who they are what side they're on, and they're wondering, who in the hell is this? And these investigations were going on. So finally, uh, MacArthur established the uh, IPU, the Internet Phenomena uh, Unit, which was basically designed to collect these reports and to begin trying to analyze just who and what and where, uh, you know, this particular manifestation came from. And I think MacArthur actually engineered the first organized uh, UFO investiga inv investigative unit. Um, there may have been some investigation going on among the Germans, but there's no record of it. Uh, there may have been some reports given among the Allied units, but I'm sure they were, you know, scoffed, you know, and dismissed, you know, as being, uh, you know, misperceptions by stressed out pilots but MacArthur made a you know, he made a great um, stride uh, towards establishing you know what was going on and years later uh, on at least two occasions he was quoted as saying uh, in front of the uh, the uh, I'm trying to think of, of, of what military academy he was speaking in front of in 1957 and 1962, he quoted himself saying, "Was it West Point? Believed, right, maybe West Point or or the uh, or the Naval Academy, where he basically was saying, I believe our next great conflict will be with an extraterrestrial civilization." From what you know, from what he had already experienced, you know, during you know the wave of uh, attacks and aggression and inexplicability that occurred in World War II in his experiences led him, you know, to, you know, to come to this conclusion along with, uh, he was joined by very, very, you know, good colleagues. Um, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the British also had a general who was responsible, uh, Lord Doubting, for defending Great Britain. Uh, in 1940, uh, during the, the Battle of Britain, when um, the Germans, you know, attempted to completely uh, force uh, England into submission by just bombing the hell out of all their major cities and their, and their air bases, and they actually uh, succeeded in defeating the Germans, and Lord Dowden came to the same conclusion that he believed that man's 
next greatest conflict would be with an extraterrestrial civilization. Now, and then we can start to theorize, you know, what manifests an extraterrestrial civilization once again. Did it already just exist here and we're misperceiving it? Well, and who determines what a civilization is um, or where it comes from? Because we have no way of knowing that we're earthbound. I mean, we have to take it on faith uh, that NASA's sending us uh, copacetic pictures, even from space. I mean, I don't know. I've never been up above 35,000 feet. How about you? Well, maybe, but not in conscious awareness. Uh, <laughs> I guess I have to I guess I have to put it that way because that would uh, but consciously, in my physicality, in my my normal waking state, I've only been up over the over the earth, you know, a little under five miles. So I don't know, but I do know that it feels doc like everything we've talked about so far feels like we're being set up for something. Uh, the the Vatican with their um, revelations about they believe that there's an extraterrestrial baptizing ETs. Um, the Lucifer Observatory at Mount Graham, New Mexico, and uh, what's coming out of there these days. And the fact that the Pope is scheduled to come to the U.S. in, I think, August or September has left me believing that we are being primed right now for something that I would just call the Great Deception. Meaning, if ET's out there and government hasn't given disclosure, despite the clamoring of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and petitions to the White House and all that other worthless horse hockey that they're doing, but what if, what if they are preparing to do Blue Beam, sanctified by the, the Pope and the Vatican, in an attempt, as you were stating earlier, to cr- kind of corral us in? Um. There is a, I heard a brilliant uh, testimony given, a uh, lecture given uh, by a former uh, Watergate uh, prosecutor, one of the prosecuting team, uh, Alan Sheehan, I believe. Sheehan is, is his last name. Uh, he appeared on one of the uh, crash retrieval conference um, um, presentations uh, with the uh, Woods, with Robert Woods and, and, and his son, uh, Ryan. And he was talking about in the early 70s, really close to the time of, of Watergate, about 1972, that the United Council of Churches had already come to a consensus that extraterrestrial contact was inevitable and that the churches need to start dealing with it. In other words, um, basically, you know, we can't go on ignoring this, that, you know, that, you know, this is sooner or later, you know, it's going to pop up right in in front of our noses, so we better get ready for it. But you know what? I still believe that at that point, even though they were basing their their consensus on observations of the planets, which in 1972 you could only there was only so much that you could really begin to extrapolate as compared to today. You know, with the you know with the uh, advanced uh, astronomical uh, capabilities we have with uh, you know, satellites that are focused outward, you know, in a, in, out, outward towards the universe. That um, they didn't have the tools then, but yet they were coming to the conclusion that people are now coming to, you know, that it's all extraterrestrial, but still, you know what, the, uh, you know, the, these spy satellites that have been turned outward towards the, you know, the universe, they may have discovered large planets and maybe even some planets that they consider to be in the Goldilocks zone, which is basically in orbit around a star where they're not so close that the, the temperatures are prohibitive towards life, and they're not so far away that temperatures are so frigid 
that life cannot exist, much like Earth. But they still don't have any proof that there's a civilization there. And if there was a civilization there that existed in the Goldilocks zone, so to speak, of those planets, then basically, like Enrico Fermi, you know, once asked, then why hasn't E.T. come and contacted us yet? And I think the answer is, is that, you know, E.T. is right here and we don't even realize it. So given that we um, kind of established that there is this, I'll call it a potential, but I think it's greater than that, connection between, uh, we'll just say, certain extraterrestrial experiences and the demonic. Can can we extrapolate out of that a little bit, Doc? I mean, if we have demons, we also have angels. And um, this is the other side of the argument. Are there positive entities, quote, out there, quote, in here, um, somewhere that, that is a rough parallel of what is obviously the hideous things that have gone on with abductions by by the greys and other races of, of human specimens now since the 1950s? Well, you know what? Um, that's a very good question, Randy, and, I, and I'm going to address it this way. I can only address it based upon all the evidence that I have examined you know, the classic, you know, UFO sightings, the classic abductions, uh, the milestone uh, incidents of, you know, uh, that you and I have discussed before of, of pilots encountering, you know, aerial phenomena that has caused crashes and deaths and disappearances uh, of, you know, of human percipients on the ground level that have experienced um, uh how should I say it, um, strange uh, aberrations, okay, that have entered their consciousness. Um, I'd have to say that, by and large, the, the influences have been negative. They've been deceptive. They've been evasive. Um, I had many readers when I was writing a column for the Plano Star Courier, and we had a circulation of about 300,000 people. So my, my columns were read pretty widely, uh, you know, among a number of different North Texas cities. And the consensus of a lot of readers that, that wrote in was they believed that a lot of this was uh, centered around um, fear, confusion, chaos, a concerted effort to create fear and confusion and chaos for a central, you know, uh, reason. You know, there, there, there apparently was a ulterior motive for all of it. And it can only be attributed towards evil. And, you know, I, I, I hate to get into that, um, how should I say, uh, a predictable sensibility of, you know, that it's all evil and it's all from Satan or Lucifer or whatever, but when you start to weigh the evidence and you start to look at the tactics employed, you know, by the entities, you start to find, and just like John Keel even said in his extrapolations and in his um, evaluations, that there seems to be a centralized you know, force of that broken record in the sky, and that broken record in the sky is deception. And it's leading us away, you know, from our purpose as human beings. So apparently we are in a spiritual battle. Um, definitely. How do, definitely. How do people deal with it? Um... I would have to say that the best way for people to deal with it is to go to their Bible, to go to, to Christianity. Um, I, I, I don't see, an, you know, from, I mean, I've been at this for decades. Um, I, I don't see another way out. I mean, I, I've, I've tried to approach this through occultism, um, through seances. I've tried to approach it through um 
uh, using, you know, positive, you know, remote viewing mind links. And it's just, it, you know, you, you keep running into more and more of a multi-layered form of deception, but it's spiritual, and it's not only spiritual. You know, when you say spiritual, it doesn't mean good or bad. It just means that in that plane, that, you know, you're encountering something outside of your body that can lead you either way to good or evil. And if you don't know what you're dealing with, um, you can deal with entities that, and, and demons that, that, you know, they will completely misguide you and send you to the depths of hell. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've tried to ignore, you know, that ultimate scenario and, you know, and try to think that, well, if end times come, you know, there's got to be the good guys and the UFOs are going to land, pick up people and take them away, you know, because they're the good civilization. But, you know, I, I, you know interviewing so many people, military and civilian and everything, I don't see that happening. You know, I, 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 I don't see, you know, uh, extraterrestrial entities as being saviors. I'll, I'll put it that simply. Yeah. You know, I just keep thinking about that time when the scriptures talk about Jesus being taken up and Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. What, right. You know, that sounds vaguely like a, a kind of experience with, uh, well, an abduction by a UFO or by an entity that was able to do that. That's it has doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it has uh, all the earmarks of it when you begin to read it. So, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I've stated many times where I basically put my faith and, and you know... He, Again, you know, it's written, he'll give his angels charge of you, and on their hands they will bear you up. And uh, I think that's maybe the only bearing up I want to have again for a long time. And um, I think there's a lot of people out there that feel the same way. Um, Doc, we're, we're bumping up against the old clock, and I want people to be able to find you. Let people know where you can, they can find your writings and, and your website as well. Uh, they can find me at politicite.com, which is a uh, political uh, 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 a political site that does a lot of uh, polling about elections. It's it's quoted quite often by Sean Hannity at Fox News. Um, I've met one two one six zero dot org. Um, I'm in Reddit. Um, I'm also in UFO Digest. Um, I get picked up by a lot of different sites that, you know, they, they, they take my writing and, you know, they, before it's news, you know, picks up a lot of my story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a, a huge number of sites that just pick my stories up, you know, and, and, and basically preview them. But let me, uh, let me make a little, a little biblical incident for you. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, we, you know, we've talked about uh, Zechariah, you know, who saw the four wheels up in the sky, and Zechariah, you know, um, who saw a, a basically what appears to be a missile by his ancient capability, you know, rising into the, into the air. But there's an account given where Jesus and his disciples walked into a region that was haunted and controlled by an individual of unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. Gadara, and, the Gadarene demoniac. Right. He was a demoniac, and he was he was possessed by several demonic spirits. Uh, spirits, and they could not um, they could not control him with chains or shackles. He lived among tombs and graves. And he terrorized the region. Um, he was beyond the control of, you know, the, the governmental authorities. So he basically roamed like a, like, like a scourge of the land. And 
when Jesus walked into that area uh, and he encountered this this, this demon uh, this this demon possessed person, all the you know uh, the the disciples immediately you know thought he was going to go for, for Jesus' throat, and instead he fell at Jesus' feet, and the demons within him spoke, and they said. Son of God, what are you doing here talking to us? All of these demons spoke at the same time out of the body of this person. They knew who the Son of God was. And Jesus just basically stood there and said, you know, um, you know, basically you've got to go. You know, I'm gonna I'm I'm going to remove you from this person's body. And so they requested that that Jesus moved them to the swine. So the, the spirit of these demons went to swine, which were wild pigs that stood on a hill. Once they were possessed by the demons, they plunged into a stream, and they completely fouled the water for the community, killing themselves, committing suicide. Um, and then this man who had been possessed and who, you know, for the first time in God knows how long, was freed of the demonic possession, said, Lord, I want to be with you from this time on. And Jesus said, no, I want you to go to all the people that knew you, and I want you to testify to God's forgiveness and God's grace and to show them what God did for you. And, you know, to me, that's amazing. I mean, you know, this sounds like something out of a Stephen King novel or Pet Cemetery <laughs> movie. It does. You know, I mean, some guy that, you know, lives among the tombstones and he's possessed by all these demons and nobody can shackle or chain him. And suddenly, you know, faced with Jesus, he falls at his feet. I mean, it's incredible. It, it really is. Well, I think that the answers lie in the parameters of what we talked about, and hopefully this message will be received, and uh, you know maybe some people will re-examine their position. The questions, obviously, we don't have the definitive answer, but um, I'm betting on the side that we got a deception coming. Doc Vega, it's been great talking to you again. It was far too long for you to come on, and we'll get you back again very soon. You can find uh, Doc Vega and many other writers over at UFODigest.com. You can find us at OffPlanetRadio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you, and uh, it is written, and we need to look for it. We'll be back with another show very soon. Good night. Thanks a lot, Randy. It's been great. Thank you, my friend. This is the battle for your mind. This is our planet radio.